This is Where We Live on Connecticut Public. I'm Lucy Nalbathanchel. Sickle cell disease is an inherited disorder, causing red blood cells to contort into a sickle shape and leading to pain and fatigue, among other symptoms, and life-threatening complications. The CDC says 100,000 Americans are affected, and one in every 365 black babies is born with the condition. One in 13 black or African-American babies are born with sickle cell trait. At the same time, black Americans struggle to access unbiased care from medical professionals, and funding for research into sickle cell is not as robust as other diseases. But there have been advances in treatment. Today, where we live, we learn about them, including the fact there is a cure for sickle cell disease through a bone marrow transplant. Coming up, we hear from a transplant physician and a young woman who was born with sickle cell disease and is now living pain-free after undergoing the transplant. Do you or someone in your family have sickle cell disease? We want to hear from you. Join us, 888-720-9677. That's 888-720-WMPR. Or you can share a comment on our Facebook page or find us on Twitter at Where We Live. Joining us first on Zoom is Rihanna Konate. She's 21 years old, lives in Connecticut. She was born with sickle cell disease, but is now cured. Rihanna, welcome to the show. Thank you for having me. Uh, You had your transplant back in in 2019, and and when I entered you as someone who's fully cured, that must be such a great feeling these last couple of years, considering what you have experienced uh, since your childhood. Correct. So tell us uh, what it was like uh, living with sickle cell disease before the transplant for people who may not understand the disease. Yeah, of course. Um, So yeah, before the transplant, it was very painful, I would say. Um, I remember when I was younger, I didn't really know what that meant. Until I was about nine, I started to understand just because the hospital became my second home. Um, Because with sickle cell, you were most likely to get crises, which Um, It depends on the person, but you would get pain anywhere between your joints. Um, Sometimes you'd get chest pain, um, just depending on where your crises would trigger. Um, So for me, it was mostly my joints and I would get like fevers and chills, um, which would lead me to the emergency room. You said that the hospital was like a second home to you starting at the age of nine. That's really difficult to hear uh, that a child experiences that, Rihanna. You also mentioned crises. So this is a term that's used to describe these intense episodes of pain for people with sickle cell disease? Exactly. And um, depending on the person, um, it typically happens, especially when the season season is changing. So for example, if we're going from the fall to winter, I personally were more likely to experience crises um, during the winter. Mm. And so you must have missed a lot of school. Yeah, I did. I was constantly missing school, um, but I did. Once I got to high school, I was kind of used to it. It became a routine. But obviously, when I was younger, elementary school, I never really understood why I was never in school or I had to miss lots of school. Um, So I kind of felt like I was missing out on a lot just because of my health. Mm. And how did you cope during that time? Um, What did your family tell you? And how did you get through those those days, Rihanna? Yeah, um, so through those days, it was difficult just because as a young child too, um, it's really easy to feel like you're missing out on a lot. Um, But personally, I think my mom and my family were my biggest supporters. Um, So they would just reassure me that, you know, although I'm a little different from the other kids, like I'm just as valuable. um, It doesn't make me any less than. um, But if anything, sickle cell makes me a little stronger than most. Mm. So tell us about when things started to get better for you. As I mentioned, you had the transplant back in 2019. Can you walk us through the process and how you even found a donor? Yeah. Um, so the process was a little difficult just because, so I currently live with my younger sister and my mom. Um, so they got tested and they weren't any matches. Um, but at the time, my older sister lived in Mali. Um, And I never got to see her before this, but Dr. Shaw, as well as the transplant team, sent out a kit to her so she can get tested to see if she was a match. Um, And once we got the results, we found out that she was a match. 
Um, and then we kind of got in the process of trying to bring her here. So Dr. Shaw was like constantly call, calling the embassy to try to get her, get her here so we can do the transplant as soon as possible. Um, so she got to travel to the States to do the transplant for me. And at the same time, I finally got to meet her for the first time um, in my life. Oh, wow. That must have been so powerful uh, to meet her and to know that she was helping you um, with this transplant, Rihanna. Doctor, you mentioned Dr. Shaw um, was one of your advocates. Uh, Dr. Nikita Shaw yes. is with us, director of the Pediatric Bone Marrow Transplant Program and director of the Pediatric Cellular Therapy Program at Yale Medicine. Dr. Shaw, welcome to the show. Thank you. Thank you. And it's, good morning, everybody. And uh, thank you for having me here. And it's wonderful to hear from Rihanna that um, she is fully cured now from sickle cell disease. I had asked her about her uh, bone marrow transplant and a little bit about the process. And so, you know, when, um, when we think about uh, when a person is able to get this transplant and then how long it takes uh, to finally get that match, I guess it depends on if you can find the match. Yes, that is correct. So um, usually um, whenever the sickle cell uh, disease patients start experiencing the crisis or start having uh, some issues, other complications with the sickle cell disease, they their family think about that can we cure or something. However, it, we recommend that that process should uh, start uh, evaluating um, um, before they experience crisis and as soon as they diagnose with the sickle cell disease at birth, maybe we need to think about that. Can we cure this disease? Because each person, as Rihanna mentioned, that each person has a different um, disease profile with the sickle cell or disease profile means different types of complication. Some may have less in the beginning. Um, Rihanna ex started experiencing the pain, more pain crisis or feeling more pain crisis when she was nine, but some may experience very early in life. So I think that think thought of cure should come, uh, we recommend early and uh, we do the donor search, meaning we find out who can be the donor to cure their sickle cell disease by donating the bone marrow. And that search we do by using this HLA typing. You know how with the blood group, we have different people with the O blood group, A blood group, B blood group, like that we have for also our uh, cells, uh, mainly all the blood cells have some criteria or the some identity, which is called HLA, human leukocyte antigen. And if they are matched, then that donor can be a, um, can donate the bone marrow to the patient to cure their underlying disease. So we do the HLA typing of the family within the sibling. However, as you mentioned that it is difficult to find a donor. Um, and as Rihanna explained, one of our younger sister was not a donor and we had to reach out to her older sister. Um, and we did the HLA typing and she was cured, um, matched to her. And that's why we pursued. So in reality, if we see the statistic, any sickle cell disease patients have 20% chance of finding a matched sibling within the family. And once we find out that there is a mad sibling, we can take the patient for transplant. Again, so I mentioned Dr. Shah, your director of the Pediatric Bone Marrow Transplant Program uh, at Yale. And so what's the typical age that a sickle cell patient can get the bone marrow transplant? That's a very tricky question, um, <laughs> but um, you, usually here we do at the minimum of five, six years of age, um, because if you do the transplant early, the success rate is very, very high. Um, so there were studies recently published with 1,500 sickle cell disease patients who received the mad sibling donor transplant. And if they had uh, received transplant less than six years of age, the success was almost 99%. So earlier is the better if you have a mad sibling um, and if you are, have started developing the pain crisis or some other complication. 
But uh, we can do, just to add, we can do the transplant at any age, like Rihanna got it three years back and she's now 21 years old. So, uh, Rihanna is still with us. Rihanna, what is life like for you now? What were some of the activities you weren't able to do that you can now do? Yeah, um, so when I had sickle cell, as I mentioned, I was constantly missing school. Um, I also couldn't participate in sports or anything that had to do with like running just because sickle cell, um, because our cells are so sickled, it makes it harder for oxygen to kind of reach everywhere in our body. Therefore, I couldn't participate in sports. I couldn't swim, um, do anything like that. So now that I am a healthy individual, it feels nice to just do like normal things. Um, so like going to the gym, I never really experienced that until after um, the transplant. Um, Dr. Shaw also told me to pick up swimming and I also couldn't do that because of, the, um, because of sickle cell as well. Um, and I'm now a full-time student, which is amazing just because I never really have to miss school. So I'm never um, behind or anything like that. So I think living a healthy life is definitely something I would say I'm really blessed to live. Well, congratulations to hear about your your success at, at UConn uh, stores, I believe. And, and how much longer before you graduate, Rihanna? So I actually graduate next year. So I'll be tr graduating in spring of 2024. Excellent. Uh, Dr. Shah, you know, when we think about the path that Rihanna, her mom, took to get to you, is it a typical path? Uh, and when you hear how well she's doing, that must be, you know, wonderful to hear. Yes, it's so amazing to hear that um, our kids are doing so well and they are back to their normal life. As a transplant physician, I see that uh, when any child has some congenital or some disease which requires or sometimes prolonged care or constant care, the parents are a little heartbroken because every step that child takes, they think about what will be their future. But now with the transplant, I'm, we feel so happy that they are back to the normal and the family can continue to dream for their kids' um, normal future. Um, this, First question was how the path takes. Yes, most of the time uh, patients are referred to us by pediatric hematologist and uh, they uh, evaluate the patients and then they if they find that there is a, a need of transplant, they refer to us. However, lately I have received even the direct referral from the patients or they will email us or contact us as they hear um, uh, about the curative option for sickle cell disease. And if they were not mentioned to them by their physician or, or they were not aware um, from the parent's perspective, they were not aware if they have mentioned it to them. Mm -hmm. And when we talk about a treatment and we learn more about sickle cell disease, Dr. Shaw, you know, I guess it's important to highlight when we think about uh, patients living with sickle cell, the life ex expectancy and, you know, how these treatments and, uh, you know, the bone marrow transplant really improves quality of life for them. Can you tell us more? Yes. So um, in reality, there are nowadays some medicines which have, and particularly in last five years, three new medicines have come to help the sickle cell disease patient um, to um, have the less crisis or the less complication. However, the patient needs to um, take those medicines regularly. And we don't know what will be the long-term effect of those medicines, but those medicines have proven to help or decrease the crisis. Uh, however, in, uh, but um, if we look at the life expectancy of a sickle cell disease uh, patient, it is two decades less than the normal life expectancy what we have in the United States. So two decades and, less. That's, yeah. all, that's huge. Yeah. And particularly as they um, become adult and advance in their age, they may have more sickle cell disease related complication. So even though the life um, expectancy is two decades less, their quality of life also in when they are 30, 40s or 50s is also a little bit affected because of some chronic issue they have. We're going to be talking more with Dr. Shaw 
here where we live in just a little bit about um, other treatments and more about medication. But I wanted to go back to Rihanna before we head to break. You know, part of the reason we wanted to do the show, Rihanna, is to help explain sickle cell disease to our listeners who may not know enough about it. And I'm wondering, you know, what you'd want our listeners to know uh, a little bit about your story as well as, you know, some takeaways. Yeah, um, my main, well, I would say for the listeners, I think it's really important to kind of dig a little deeper into the disease and try to understand why there is a lack of attention on the disease. Um, Granted, it does affect a lot of African Americans. And personally, I've never had to experience any racial bias or anything like that. But I know people are facing that and it makes it harder to kind of get those resources that they need to not only have a healthy lifestyle but to live a longer life. So I think it is important for our listeners to not only educate themselves but try to see what they can do to kind of help with the problem. So simply just getting um, donating blood for example. Um, Constantly as a sickle cell patient, when you do get those crises, when it's really bad, you do have to get a blood transfusion. And because people are donating blood, it makes our life a little easier as well when we are going through these crises. So simply donating blood when you can or if you can or also um, seeing if you are a potential match. So it doesn't have to technically be like a bone marrow transplant, but um, if you can see if you can just change anyone's life, whether it's a five-year-old, an 18-year-old, whoever it may be, um, I think it will have a lasting impact, not only on the patient, um, but to a listener who may take this away as well. Thank you so much, Rihanna Konate. And we'll be talking uh, coming up on the show about the barriers to access to care. That's so important. Rihanna, again, is 21 years old. She was born with sickle cell disease, but she's now cured after undergoing a bone marrow transplant in 2019. Rihanna, all the best to you. Thank you for your time today. Thank you so much for having me. You're listening to Where We Live on Connecticut Public. I'm Lucy Nalbethanchel. Dr. Nikita Shaw will stay with us, Director of the Pediatric Bone Marrow Transplant Program and Director of the Pediatric Cellular Therapy Program at Yale Medicine. After the break, we're going to learn more, as I mentioned, about treatments for sickle cell disease, including gene therapy. What questions do you have? You can join us too, 888-720-9677, or find us on Facebook and Twitter at Where We Live. This is where we live on Connecticut Public. I'm Lucy Nalpathanchel. We're learning about new treatments and therapies to help patients with sickle cell disease. Hearst reported that since 2017, the FDA has approved three new medications for the disorder. Do you or someone in your family have sickle cell disease? We want to hear from you. You can join us, 888-720-9677. That's 888-720-WMPR. Or find us on Facebook and Twitter at Where We Live. With us on Zoom is Dr. Nikita Shaw, Director of the Pediatric Bone Marrow Transplant Program and Director of the Pediatric Cellular Therapy Program at Yale Medicine. Uh, Janet's calling in with a question. Janet, go ahead. I was wondering if um, the uh, patients who receive the stem cell or bone marrow transplant, if they experience graft-versus-host disease. Thank you, Janet, for that question. Dr. Shaw? That is a very good question. And yes, there are chances uh, um, that those patients may receive, um, um, uh, who receives the stem cell transplant or uh, bone marrow transplant can develop the graft versus host disease. However, chances depends on who is the match uh, or the who is the donor and uh, also what each child uh, receives the transplant and who uh, what age the donor is donating the, uh, their cells. Dr. So, Shah, can you briefly explain what graft versus host disease is? 
yes, I can explain. So when, as I uh, in earlier um, talk, I explained that we select the donor based on this HLA typing. And as I mentioned that uh, only 20% of the sickle cell disease patient has a chances of finding a match sibling donor. However, when these new cells are implanted into the patient, they may sometimes fight with the patient's own some of the rest of the cells. As in bone marrow transplant, we are just replacing the bone marrow of a patient, not all the other body cells. And those may get little bit effect because of the transplant process. And when the new cells are healing them, they may find some difference. And that little bit of the fighting is called the graft, means the new cells versus host, means the patient cells. And so that develops some type of graft versus host disease. It's a type of one complication which can occur in post uh, bone marrow transplant patients. Um, however, I would just go on and explain that the chances of GVHD, we call it graft versus host disease in short form, is less when the sibling is a match um, and particularly if the patient receives a transplant at earlier age and also the donor also is a little bit younger than uh, 10 years, or then the chances of GVHD is less in sickle cell disease patients. Chances of graft versus host disease will then increase if sibling is not a match. Um, and that I can explain you in a further mm -hmm. talk. But so you're uh, you're doing a study right now again to show um, and it's showing promising results uh, to reduce risk from these complications. Can you tell us briefly about that, Dr. Shaw? Yes, that's what. Uh, so we have an ongoing study at Yale um, uh, uh, th that adding one of the agent um, or the new drug into the uh, transplant process has helped us reduce the risk of graft versus host disease. Even if the donor is some unknown donor from the beta match registry, sometimes we select the donor, or if the donor is not 100% match and the donor is just 90% match. And in those patients also, when we use that drug in the transplant mm -hmm. process, we saw very less graft versus host disease. When we think about um, a sibling match, if a child is, is an only child, and so are you then looking at other relatives before you go to a non-family donor, Dr. Shaw? Um, um, so we do a little bit other way. We search the uh, unrelated donor registry first, um, which is a be the match registry um, in U.S. and that registry was started in 1986 with 10,000 donors, and now the Be The Match registry has more than 22 million donors. So if you see, just hypothetically, each patient who needs transplant should find a donor from those 22 million voluntary donors who are ready to donate. However, in reality, it is not uh, because out of 22 million donors, almost 70% of the donors are Caucasian. So for all minority subgroup, African-American, Asian, Hispanic, chances of finding a 100% match in the registry are again only 20%, mm -hmm. particularly for the African-American uh, sickle cell disease. So we have, we know this reality. So now we have some other ways also to do the transplant by choosing different donor. Sometimes we choose the 90% match donor from the registry, or in recent years, we are also doing the relative, like who are not 100% match, but just for 50% match, either father, mother, or half match sibling. We also consider them as a donor. But in this situation, we do a little bit different way. The transplant technique is little different, so they don't experience um, more side effect because the donor is not 100% match. 
You're hearing Dr. Nikita Shaw here where we live, director of the Pediatric Bone Marrow Transplant Program and director of the Pediatric Cellular Therapy Program at Yale Medicine as we talk about sickle cell disease and learn about a new treatments and therapies. You know, Rihanna left us with some powerful words uh, to remind uh, listeners and, um, you know, the systems that we have in place. Uh, you know, people of color um, still have trouble accessing care. Um, and also when we think about even um, participation and clinical trials, Dr. Shah. Can you talk more about that? So um, at um, Yale uh, New Haven Children's Hospital, uh, Spinal Cancer Center and the Yale School of Medicine, it's a combined uh, program for pediatric bone marrow transplant and cellular therapy um, uh, to offer the curative option for not only sickle cell disease, but some other uh, disease patients. And here we have um, last five years, uh, bone marrow transplant uh, st research studies, where it allows the patient to undergo the transplant, which as a standard of care, they won't be able to get the transplant. So at present, uh, American Society of Hematology has recommended that mad sibling donor transplant for sickle cell disease is a standard of care. So they don't need any study because it has proven much more beneficial to the sickle cell disease patients. For other um, donor option transplant, suppose if they don't have mad sibling, then it is recommended you do the transplant on the study. And here we have the studies. And some of the studies are here we have are mainly in this whole New England area. Our center has those studies open and it has allowed um, some other sickle cell disease patients to undergo transplant if they don't have sibling donor um, as a match and also experience less uh, complications. And I mentioned earlier that we have the study with added one new agent. And by adding that new drug, we have seen that they do also almost similar to the mad sibling donor transplant and not experiencing more graft versus host disease, which is the concern. And Dr. Shah, we, we got a question from a listener in West Haven who wants to know, you know, how early can people test for sickle cell disease? You know, um, Here in Connecticut, it is included in the newborn screening program. So as soon as the child is born, um, uh, under newborn screening, we know that they may have sickle cell disease and then they, with those potential result, the, those patients are referred to the hematologist. So the babies are referred and then they confirm the diagnosis. And that test uh, in, for newborns, has that been uh, for many years in Connecticut? Yes, I, to my knowledge, yes, for almost five, six years or more. You can join our conversation if you have questions about sickle cell disease or if you or a family member have the disorder. Our number, 888-720-9677, or find us on Facebook and Twitter at Where We Live. You know, there there seems to be a lot of buzz around gene therapy, Dr. Shaw. Uh, the FDA just approved a gene therapy drug to treat thalassemia, which is a blood disorder. So um, I'm wondering if you can talk a little bit about gene therapy and with this new drug approved for thalassemia, you know, how that that bodes for sickle cell disease patients? That's a very good question. And it's the um, new innovation coming up in the sickle cell disease. Uh, also, um, as I mentioned that for curative option right now for sickle cell disease, um, bone marrow transplant is the only available option right now. And to do the bone marrow transplant, we need a donor. It can be mad sibling or some unknown donor or half match um, family donor. Um, but chances of finding fully matched donor, either mad sibling or unknown donor, are still less, not 100%. And if we use some other alternative donor, there is this risk of graft versus host disease. And sometimes even those donors are not at all available for the sickle cell disease patients. So to overcome this, there is this gene therapy where the process is you take patient's own bone marrow and then in the laboratory, you replace 
or you can just add a new healthy gene into their bone marrow by different techniques and there are different techniques right now ongoing in the research but that adding that healthy gene or replacing the old or editing the old defective gene the new bone marrow which uh, comes up has healthy hemoglobin so they may have little sickle cell disease but there is a more healthy hemoglobin which overcomes and then you replace that new modified bone marrow into the patient and that is called the gene therapy and as you mentioned uh, lucy that yes fda just two two and a half weeks back only approved uh, gene therapy for thalassemia and similar research are ongoing in sickle cell disease particularly for those patients who doesn't have a mad sibling donor options or the other options and they are still continuing with the uh, more of sickle cell related complication so we will see the results sometime soon and then um it will add um if it approves down the road it will be adding the one of the more option for cure for sickle cell disease mm. i think I, i read that it's been over 100 years or about 100 years since sickle cell disease was first uh, discovered and diagnosed and so when we think about the rate uh, of of research that's going into uh, this particular disease uh, uh, dr shah i'm wondering if you can give us a little bit of perspective on that Yes so as you mentioned this disease has been diagnosed almost 100, one century back but most of the research have been done in last 50 years um i would say previously there were two peak in the death in this sickle cell disease patients one in first 10 years of age mainly because of their um they experienced severe complication with the sickle cell disease and they had also high risk of infection one of our yale pioneer um dr howard pearson was pioneer in this uh, sickle cell disease research in 70s and he recommended adding some infection prevention strategy which abolish or decrease the risk of death in first decade in childhood however uh, the other complications or morbidity continues uh, and then the new drug hydroxyurea came um into place in early 2000 um and that also helped to reduce some complication but that drug need to be taken regularly apart from continuing to get some high, uh, patients who develop severe complication to have continuous blood transfusion also so those were the main stream of mm-hmm. pre- infection prevention um hydroxyurea and blood transfusion support in the early year, um earlier in before 2010 and then these some other regions came and which were at, as you mentioned earlier in 2017 fda approved three new drug Uh, which are also helping the support um or uh, lessen the complication of this sickle cell disease and if we look at the transplant the first bone marrow transplant for sickle cell disease was done in 1984 it was by chance that one of the patient had a sickle cell disease and also had leukemia and he received transplant from um his match sister who didn't have sickle cell disease and that helped him to get cured of the leukemia but also the sickle cell disease and that paved the way to explore more of this curative option for sickle cell disease with the transplant and now in last two decades we have modified or improved our transplant technique with the goal that we want our sickle cell disease patients if they undergo a transplant have less and less side effects and and with that we have this increased success rate with mad sibling donor which is almost more than 90% at any age group and also with on, if they don't have a mad sibling with any other donor also the success rate are high with less complications and now you. we have this gene therapy also coming mm-hmm. up into the cure of the sickle cell disease so, so this the is future, the overall 
The future is promising, Dr. Shah. (laughs) Thank you for that context and uh, for the perspective that you brought uh, to this conversation. Dr. Nikita Shah, Director of the Pediatric Bone Marrow Transplant Program and Director of the Pediatric Cellular Therapy Program at Yale Medicine. Thank you, Dr. Shah. Thank you very much. Thank you. You're listening to Where We Live on Connecticut Public. Now, earlier we learned from 21-year-old Rihanna Konate about the instrumental role her physician, Dr. Shaw, and Yale social worker played in helping her find a donor match for her bone marrow transplant. Up next, we talk to a social worker helping sickle cell patients through Yukon Health. That's after a short break. You can join us too, 888-720-9677, or find us on Facebook and Twitter at Where We Live. This is where we live on Connecticut Public. I'm Lucy Nalpathanchel. Coming up tomorrow, incumbent Ned Lamont joins us in studio to talk about his re-election campaign. He'll answer our questions and yours about the state of Connecticut. We want to hear from you. What questions do you have for Governor Ned Lamont? That conversation tomorrow on air and online. Today we've been learning about sickle cell disease, and Dhruv Kular is a practicing physician and an assistant professor at the Will Cornell Medical College. Earlier this year, he wrote about the cure for sickle cell disease for The New Yorker. Quote, he wrote, more than a century after sickle cell disease was first diagnosed, advances in gene therapy are poised to make it not just treatable, but curable. But technology is only one part of the medicine. The treatments won't be cheap, and many of the people who need them the most are on the fringes of a medical system that have marginalized them. Sickle cell disease traces the deep, long-standing inequities of American society. Defeating it will require confronting them. Now, we wanted to learn more about the people working to help sickle cell patients break through these barriers and connect to successful treatments and therapies. My next guest has been a social worker for sickle cell patients for the last decade for Yukon Health. Teresa Works is a licensed clinical social worker. Teresa, welcome to the show. Hi, thank you for having me, Lucy. So I mentioned that you've been doing this for over a decade, and as a, a social worker working with sickle cell patients, tell us about you know some of uh, the the services that you provide for them. Well, I um, very much appreciate what Dr. Shaw and Rayana have um, already kind of illuminated, which that this disease is very um, unpredictable. It can be triggered by infection. It can be triggered by heat and cold. Um, As Dr. Shaw indicated, uh, patients typically uh, did not survive into adulthood um, until the um, antibiotic therapy began um, about 20 or 30 years ago. And so um, my I I did start with the uh, New England Sickle Cell Institute about 10 years ago, and we were um, only the second adult provider of uh, sickle cell disease care in the state. So uh, working with patients with this disease, there needs to be a lot of advocacy. Um, As Rihanna indicated, she's missed a lot of school um, as a result of, of the unpredictable pain crises, that temperature can be a precipitant of these crises, infection can precipitate it, stress can precipitate precipitate it. So, um, and this continues into adulthood. So attempting to work with patients and and within the school systems, if they're in college with their employers to educate their employers and to provide them um, protections through the Americans with Disabilities Act by getting 504 uh, plans in place with the schools or IEPs, um, FMLA paperwork or ADA paperwork with employers and performing that kind of education and advocacy Mm -hmm. so that our patients are aware of what their rights are is extremely important. And Teresa, Um, can you explain a little bit more about that? So some of the stigma or judgment that sickle cell patients are even facing in the workplace because of their symptoms. Exactly. I mean, we're working with a population that are predominantly black and brown skin. So Um, There's a lot of perjurative stereotypes um, that are associated with that about people perhaps not wanting to work or not being motivated to work. 
Um, and so, uh, you know, my advocacy and helping patients advocate for themselves is to inform employers, inform school systems that this is not a disease of willpower. This is, in fact, a medical diagnosis and that, it, you know, impedes people from performing tasks that they are, you know, would like to perform in a, in a competent and, and functional manner on a day-to-day -day basis. Um, so getting protections in place, uh, working with the employers, working with the patient, um, meeting with employers uh, or school systems as necessary is a big part of the advocacy that social workers mm -hmm. do. Um, and that is done reg regularly to uh, allow people to maintain their jobs, to get accommodations in school if they need extensions and taking tests or they need more time to make up missed classes, um, helping the school systems understand that these this uh, patient population is protected under state mm -hmm. and federal law. Um, uh, Teresa, and I'm wondering, but, um, before we run out of time, when we think about judgment that sickle cell patients even experience from medical providers, we know studies show there's significant barriers to care that exists for African American patients with sickle cell disease. When I'm thinking about, you know, the, the long term pain that they're experiencing, and if they go to the ER, it's longer wait times to even get the pain medication they need. Can you talk about that? Uh, yes, thank you. That's actually a really good point, um, Lucy. We have uh, done a lot of advocacy as adult providers for sickle cell care, and, and part of that is working within our own UConn institution to um, collaborate and to have them really understand the importance of um, appropriate appropriate and rapid treatment that pain is real and pain is not um, something you can look at a person and necessarily assess. You know, pain is very subjective based on the individual. Um, and so starting with our emergency department, we have for all of our adult sickle cell patients, we have a pain plan on file. So the provider in the ER can um, look in our medical record, they can access uh, our treatment plan, the patient's personalized pain plan, and, and start that pain plan immediately in the ER. Uh, we also um, work closely with our hematology team, um, and we have a device called a, um, a PCA, which is basically a pain pump that uh, can be started in the ER prior to the patient being admitted that allows them um, on, a, on a timed out basis to inject themselves with opioid medication based on their pain plan so that they have some control and can get some immediate relief. Um, we try to have patients started on their pain plan within 30 minutes of arrival in the ED, and we worked very closely with the ER providers to kind of understand our rationale for treatment, to educate them about the comorbidities such as acute chest syndrome, pneumonia, avascular necrosis, and all of these risk factors that uh, really can become life-threatening, um, as well as to provide a compassionate and um, empathetic approach to the pain management that goes with all of this. Mm. That's good to hear. And is there feedback also shared from, from patients? You know, if they are experiencing, uh, you know, some skepticism when they're asking for pain uh, medication, uh, you know, and how that trickles back uh, to the clinicians, Teresa? Um, yes, I often am called not only by patients if they feel that there's barriers to their care from the ER, but if a physician just has questions, um, they'll directly speak to myself or our, my director. Um, we can go down to the ER if it's absolutely needed, if the issue can't be resolved over the phone to meet with the provider, meet with the patient and help sometimes to just clarify next steps, uh, appropriate treatment interventions at that point. Um, and you know, we, we have a very good working relationship with our patients. We, um, they're very clear if they feel that, you know, there's been a barrier to their care and we are constantly doing quality um, improvement projects to try to make sure that these situations don't happen again. Um, you know, obviously emergency rooms are very busy places. So we have no control over the staffing or the volume in any emergency room at any given time, but our guide, lines are clear and we always attempt to do best practices in working with our patients. And so when we look, think about standard of care, best practices, I understand at, at UConn right now, the wait time would be, what, 45 minutes for pain meds? When we look at how black patients are treated nationally, they can wait for hours in the ER. 
Yeah, we actually, um, I clarified with my director and our, our goal is 30 minutes or less. Um, and our nurses can initiate the pain plans that are on file with just a verbal order for the physician to help expedite that process. Um, so we really do have a system in place that attempts to alleviate pain and suffering from the moment this patient arrives and is checked in at the triage station, um, that they're treated compassionately and with a personalized plan geared toward their sickle cell disease. That's great to hear. When we think about a new transfusion treatment, you know, how are you seeing hospitalization rates dropping among sickle cell patients, Teresa? We um, have, uh, as part of our New England Sickle Cell Institute, we have an uh, infusion room. And so patients are scheduled regularly for um, procedures such as erythrocytophoresis, which is basically we have a machine that um, patients are hooked up to. They can have blood fresh blood brought in and their sickled blood is pulled off. These treatments um, are done, you know, between three to six weeks apart typically. And again, as uh, Rihanna has mentioned, the need for uh, blood donors in the African-American and Hispanic population is extremely necessary because this um, apheresis process uh, presents not only, prevents not only pain in our adult patients, but it prevents the risk of stroke and other secondary complications. So we're really talking about life-saving standards of care. And as Dr. Shah mentioned, there are several new drugs that we're using. Um, hydroxyurea is an older drug. It's a chemotherapy agent that um, increases fetal hemoglobin, which then reduces the risk of organ damage and pain crises, and then also reduces the need for blood products. Adac Veo, uh, which is a monthly transfusion um, infusion that's done in our infusion room, works by making the um, sickled cells more slippery so they don't clog up in the in the um, arteries and capillaries, and that will reduce the pain crisis. That has um, um, anecdotally seems to have really made a difference in a lot of our patients, both in terms of reducing hospitalizations, but also reducing their pain and suffering, keeping them at work, keeping them at school, uh, reducing their need to come into the infusion room or the emergency room or the hospital to manage their pain. They're able to manage these crises at home. So uh, we also have Exprita, which uh, improves the level of hemoglobin and oxygenation in the blood. So we have a lot of options now, as Dr. Shaw mentioned, which um, really are disease modifying, disease preventing treatments. And that has been um, an enormous improvement because 10 years ago when I started, we really could only offer palliative care. We could offer hydroxyurea. We could offer acute pain management. We could offer transfusion and hydration. And that really didn't prevent any, you know, as much as, mm -hmm. as the treatments that we have now present, That's prevent the crises. That's good to hear. Teresa Works again, who's a licensed clinical social worker at UConn Health, been working with sickle cell patients for more than a decade. Thank you for your time. Thank you for having me, Lucy. This is Where We Live. I'm Lucy Nalpathanchel. Today's show produced by Sujata Srinivasan. Our technical director is Kat Pastor. Again, tomorrow, incumbent Ned Lamont will be in studio with us to answer our questions and yours about his reelection campaign. We hope you join us. Thank you.